All right. Good morning, uh, <clears throat> everybody. Happy Friday. Um, welcome to this week's AMSSM Sports Ultrasound case series presentation. Uh, we are continuing with our faculty presentation um, uh, section of this of this whole whole case series. Um, today, we uh, we're, we're fortunate to have uh, Dr. Phil Steele. Um, giving us a, a, a talk here, just a, a, a quick a quick piece of background on on Phil. So he's primary care sports medicine. He's got family medicine training background. Um, currently out in uh, in practice in Helena, uh, Montana, at this current uh, current moment. Um, Phil is uh, is one of the the, the nation's experts in uh, ultrasound of peripheral nerves, and he and he has a very special interest in disorders of the scapula. Um, so we're, we're really fortunate to have him here this morning to, to talk about that interest of his. So he will be giving us a talk on a, on a case of a patient with, um, with scapular dyskinesis. And with that, I will let Phil take over. Okay. Does everybody see this? I hope. Yeah, it looks great. Okay, so, um, well, good morning. Um, scapular dyskinesis is a daunting topic uh, for this uh, uh, format. Uh, you know, we do workshops that are full day on this. Uh, I've done it with other uh, associations. Hopefully one day we could do a, an AMSSM workshop. Um, the, this is the first layer of the onion um, on how to get started in the basics. Most of you probably never followed uh, levator scapula from uh, all, from the superior meter border of the scapula all the way up to its insertions to the posterior tubercles. Um, and, and that's a great exercise in learning and, uh, and, and, and uh, sort of uh, humbling uh, when you first begin. Um, we, uh-oh, there we go. Um, so in terms of scapular dyskinesis, it really does require a complex understanding of shoulder scapular motion as well as an understanding of the cervical and brachial plexus and nerve entrapments of the dorsal scapula nerve, spinal accessory nerve, and long thoracic nerve, which we're not going to really cover today. We're just covering the main musculoskeletal uh, portion of the scapula. And we're not going to even get to all of the main insertions, just the most uh, common um, sort of standard examination that I do. If you have a complex gain, you're also going to need to understand the biotensegrity model of, of the scapula and how it tension works to stabilize the scapula. And that, that is critical. And that's, that's a full one hour workshop in itself. But hopefully I'll pique that interest and get people interested in those areas. If you're needing more resources, this is a talk that's on YouTube uh, from uh, this uh, spring's MSSM annual meeting which goes through the scapular dyskinesis kind of from the beginning to the end and the more advanced concepts. And then if you're needing help with the brachial plexus or cervical plexus in advanced brachial plexus concepts, especially the levator scap, posterior scaling, I would go to this uh, through AIUM uh, and I've given those talks as well. So we'll sort of jump in. Uh, my patient's uh, a delightful, just a, a 18 year old, uh, a healthy female uh, high school senior who has a two year history of pain uh, with playing tennis. The pain began about two years ago. It's nonspecific, no injury. And it got to the point where this burning pain would get so severe, she just couldn't complete her matches. And most matches she had to just drop out of. She never could finish any of her uh, competitive uh, competitions. In practice, if she did a lot of serving, it would get worse. Initially, it was just a burning sensation at the superior meter border. And it and really got to the point where it just hurt with all tennis motion. She had numerous uh, provider evaluations. She's had five months of physical therapy uh, 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 in this course. Uh, and despite getting a lot of gains in strength, she continued to have pain with uh, tennis. She's had a couple injections. She's had an MRI of her neck and shoulder. All were reportedly fairly normal. And despite this, she just uh, continues to get frustrated and not being able to resolve her symptoms. And so this uh, um, is my uh, physical exam, essentially a normal uh, neck. Uh, what's important in terms of your scanning is the uh, bilateral levator scap and the serratus anterior at the first rib were negative to uh, palpation and stretch test, which is an important component of your uh, complex examination. And her shoulder exam is pretty normal other than uh, she's weak in the prone position, 
with her arm overhead, straight out. Uh, if you try to push it towards the floor, she's weak on the right versus the left. Her scapula exam uh, is important in that um, it's slightly lateralized, uh, which is important in terms of your ultrasound uh, component. You want to pay a little attention to that. Uh, it's 10, 10 centimeters on the right from midline and 9.5 on the left, which is a very subtle uh, change, but significant. And the entire medial border is uh, as a, a prominence with forward flexion. And there's a question of uh, a, a small inferior medial border winging pattern with abduction, which can clue you into a spinal accessory nerve involvement. Um, she measures out equally at the inferior medial border and her rhomboid major and minor are kind of boggy when you're doing muscle strength testing in the over arm position like she's serving. And uh, if you assist levator scap and rhomboid minor, so when I say assist, I'll put my finger on that muscle, like one finger and I'll pull with about one or two pounds of pressure and pull in its normal contraction pattern and her strength improves. So those are all things that guide you in terms of your ultrasound. So it, you do need a complex physical exam and functional exam. Uh, to highlight your ultrasound. And um, the key points in her exam is we need to spend some time at that superior meter border because that's where her pain is. Uh, strength improves with rhomboid minor. So we're going to spend a little extra time there and looking at levator scap as well. And then uh, obviously the um, spinal accessory nerve based on that inferior meter border uh, area. What's important to realize is not all cases have an obvious, obvious winging pattern. So it is important to uh, use uh, your iPad or uh, your phone or whatever and take video clips of your patient. So once you've completed a physical exam of the scapula, because the scapula is a challenging territory in terms of your ultrasound evaluation, you should develop a hypothesis in terms of uh, what you're going to spend a little extra time on and then run through your protocol, which I'll show here in a second. Your goal of your musculoskeletal exam is hopefully either confirm or refute your hypothesis by using a, sim a systematic and comprehensive exam. And then uh, in more complex cases, you're gonna need to include the neurologic component and or fascial component in terms of your exam. This is my scanning protocol that I've been using for about four or five years now. Um, and I drew a red line here because we're not going to cover any of the, the nerve stuff, but um, basically we're going to cover uh, the basics here. This is sort of the first layer of the onion uh, in terms of determining uh, a healthy scapula musculoskeletal tissue. So I begin with uh, using a, a sagittal image through the thorax. Uh, right over the scapula, looking down at the supraspinatus tendon and looking for symmetry. So you can clearly see on this patient, uh, this is not our, our patient. These are just examples of other patients that have pathology. A clear difference between the right and left uh, side in terms of the size of the supraspinatus tendon. You're going to evaluate for uh, the trapezius and whether the echo texture is different, there's atrophy, uh, and again, uh, what's happening with this fascia, you can see that the fascia is thicker on this patient uh, uh, on the right versus the left. And so these fascial uh, areas are important in terms of your overall assessment. Then I'm going to look uh, short axis at teres uh, minor and infraspinatus, and you're going to want to run uh, from the medial border of the scapula all the way out to the, sh uh, the shoulder and look for atrophy. So you can clearly see an asymmetry in terms of the infraspinatus on the right versus the left with uh, fatty infiltration and uh, irregular echo texture in here uh, and uh, look for symmetry in the traps, even though the, the trap is slightly different between these two. And you just have to get good at trying to find the same location for your images uh, in terms of uh, measuring the size of the muscle. So the challenge in um, scapular dyskinesis is the levator scap in the trap. And, and we're not going to cover all aspects of the upper trap, middle trap, and lower trap. That, that's almost a 30-minute discussion in itself. But when you're first learning um, to do the uh, scapular evaluation, you need to have a good understanding of levator scap. So here I am. I'm just going to scan up and down the neck, following from the mid-shoulder portion all the way up into the distal, uh, so here's levator, this is trap, that's a first crib. And I'm just sort of scanning up and looking at these distant insertions. And so this is a good to practice to go back and forth, watch levator scap slide in under here and trap come over the top as you go up and down the neck. What's important, and I'm gonna, whoops, go back. Uh, I'm gonna move this slide here to this section. 
right here, I'm going to stop it. Poop, yep, didn't work. Uh, well, I'm not going to be able to get that to work. So right here at the end of this, you'll see a straightest anterior come in, right? It's going to come in from this direction underneath the levator. That's an important finding, and you need to be able to reproduce this trap, levator scap, and the emergence of straightest anterior, because that's the critical element in terms of superior meter border of the scapula is the straightest anterior uh, levator scapula. And so this is that same picture uh, looking just at the uh, superficial. So here's the position of the patient. Uh, this is anterior, this is posterior, this is trapezius. And this is levator scap coming in under here. Spinal accessory nerve comes in this fascial plane and dorsal scapula nerve will come down in this fascial plane. That's dorsal scap right there. And straightest anterior as you slide laterally will emerge under here. Now you can get confused. Uh, there's a little small attachment of the posterior scaling that comes in underneath uh, straightest anterior uh, onto the second rib, which we're not gonna cover today. But um, this relationship is really important in terms of understanding trapezius levator scap. And then as you slide lateral straightest anterior, once you've completed that assessment, looking for muscle atrophy and look for symmetry of the muscle development, you're then gonna wanna switch to a, uh, a, a true axial plane to the thorax and sort of show, uh, uh, long axis to the trap. So this is middle trap fibers here. This is infraspinatus, medial border of the scapula. This is rhomboid here, and then this is rib uh, and lung under here. And so this area is, is very important in terms of uh, this sort of drop off here. And so you'll see that the fascial component can get thickened with overhead repetitive use. So rhomboid, trap, and then this fascial layer here, and then here's infraspinatus again. And so you're gonna to wanna to take measurements of this and make sure the trap that looks symmetrical as well as the rhomboid uh, echo texture and structure looks normal. And occasionally you'll see a change or hyperechoic signal uh, uh, that could represent an old tear uh, to that area. And you're gonna to wanna to repeat this process at the spine of the scapula and then inferior meter border of the scapula and make these measurements. So you're scanning. So first uh, up high, you're gonna get some of the upper trap fibers. At the spine of the scapula, you're gonna get middle trap fibers. And then here down here, you're gonna get lower trap fibers and look for atrophy of those, of those tissue planes. And then once I've completed that part, I do a functional component of my exam. Now, this is in my order. Um, and I'm looking for whether the patient has this punched out lesion. So this is uh, uh, medial. Here's the medial border of the scapula, uh, the medial superior border of the scapula between flexion and extension as I come up. Um, I'm going to see this punched out lesion, uh, which is creating inflammation and irritation of the spinal accessory nerve in this fascial layer. So trap a soft connective tissue. This is the superficial fascia here, but this, these are all spinal accessory nerve fibers running down to innervate the lower trap. And so this is an important part. And, and frequently in our patient, this was a very positive component of her examination. Then once you've completed the, the windshield wiper, uh, I'll uh, switch to a long axis. And what I'm gonna do is at the superior meter border, here I am right here, I'm gonna slide my transducer up and I'm slowly gonna dial my transducer towards uh, kind of the C2, C3 area to get true long axis to the levator scap. And by doing that, you're gonna be able to evaluate this at a much uh, um, uh, better, uh, in terms of the entirety or the, the uh, functionality of this. And so, um, it, it's, this is a, you'll have to practice this a few times, but it's a practice well worth learning because frequently you'll pick up a pathology in this area that you weren't aware on the short axis version. And then uh, once you complete that, then I'll go back to my original position. And uh, here I'm going to slide up and down the neck and then get centered over the superior meter board of the scapula. And I'm going to tow my probe down anteriorly so that I look back into the superior meter border. And if you do it correctly, you'll get a sharp margin here uh, for the underneath surface there. This is the second rib, this is trap, and this is levator scap. What's important to realize is that this area is a conjoined tendon. So even though we're taught uh, differently, this is a conjoined tendon of straightest anterior, levator scap, and rhomboid major. 
And so that because it's a conjoined tenon, you have to evaluate all three aspects of this. And what's important is that frequently you'll see small avulsions or, or tears into this area with people with chronic pain at the superior meter border. So this is kind of my proposition uh, for long axis and then this the proposition for a true um, uh, axial image that I'm getting here or sagittal image through the, um, the thorax is, is in about this position. So this is a practice that you're going to go back and forth. And once you've established a good toe in version of the levator scap, then you're going to slide laterally over the second rib and look for serratus anterior. So, so pure meter border is just right here. What I'm looking for is the serratus anterior muscular thickness. And so here there's atrophy over the second rib of this muscle compared to this other side. And so for those of you that uh, and, um, look at long thoracic nerve um, in, the, in the neck, um, you'll have to identify the branch of the long thoracic nerve to here, which is, is called the R1 branch of the uh, office C5. And so um, this is an important finding and helps you in terms of trying to uh, change this. Obviously, the atrophy can also occur from a tear. And so once I've, I've done my measurements in terms of the, the thickness of the serratus anterior, uh, then I'm going to do a toe uh, back look, sort of my look back technique and this is serratus anterior, this is second rib, um, and this is my medial border of the scapula trap over the top. And you can see these hyperechoic signals in here that, and then this is a small avulsion on this side. So a bony avulsion, irregularities of the fiber, it's all disorganized. This serratus anterior uh, has been injured, um, and, and although this side has some issues as well. But this is, surprisingly more common to see the injury on the serratus anterior than the levator scap. And in my clinical practice where I see people from all over the country for scapular dyskinesis issues or chronic scapular pain, it's more often not that it's the serratus anterior that's the culprit and not the levator scap. So we're all focused on the levator scap, but in reality, it, it, more often than not, it's the serratus anterior. So this is another example of a small bony avulsion on another patient off the serratus anterior. So they just pulled a piece of bone off uh, in terms of uh, repetitive overuse. Uh, and then the comparison left and right and trapezius, second rib, uh, um, superior meter border. So this look back technique where you're looking back into it is an important acquired skill. Once I've completed that, I'm going to uh, look at the rhomboid major up and down the entire medial border of the scapula. And so above the spine of the scapula, so if you can't, you're not sure where the spine of the scapula is, uh, run up and down the medial border until you see loss of the sort of normal drops off to the infraspinatus and you'll get a solid white line of the bone, uh, uh, the, the bony margin here of the spine of the scapula. And so as you go back and forth, you, when you're above that uh, bony margin, you're in the minor, and when you go below, it's major. And we're gonna compare uh, these two areas. So here's trap fibers. This is rhomboid, uh, rib and lung. And so in here, you wanna look for a normal smooth echo texture related to irregularities seen here and some volume loss in terms of what's happening at the rhomboid major. And so these are the things that you wanna look for as you're scanning up and down. And so I'll do, uh, uh, left and right comparisons all the way up and down. Now, be careful that uh, the app you use for your anatomy, this is actually incorrect. The inferior meter border of the uh, rhomboid major goes all the way uh, down to here. So uh, watch out for uh, these apps that are frequently incorrect. And then um, as part of that, oops, uh, you're gonna wanna assess for fascial thickness over the inferior meter border once you're down there. And uh, so if somebody has scapular winging, you'll see thickness of these uh, fascial fibers over the top of that. And again, the spinal accessory nerve fibers are, are traversing down through this layer and can create a burning sensation. And you compare major uh, down at the inferior border. So scapula, uh, uh, teres, uh, minor uh, infraspinatus, uh, and then uh, 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 rib and lung here. So you're going to want to get good at following the entire media border up and down. Uh, and then once you complete that, I'll also slide over and look at the rhomboid attachments to the spinous processes, which is another lecture. And then after completing the inferior media border from the uh, Terry's uh, major standpoint, I'll slide over and pick up the serratus anterior. I'm not going to talk about uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 um, Terry's uh, uh, major here. But um, what 
Um, the this is the inferior meter border in here, and I'm looking back. And I lay my patient in a sideline position, arm in a hundred degree to 120 degrees uh, uh, over uh, and up and forward flexion, and I'll follow the latissimus dorsi down uh, to the inferior meter border, and then I'll start looking at the serratus anterior. So I'll sort of slide over and then look at, at this insertion. And so it should be normal uh, sort of echo texture, it's sort of smooth uh, looking. And where on this side, you see sort of irregularities and a loss of that sharp contrast that sort of suggests there may some, be some edema or swelling of the muscle insertion. And in more complex cases in the, in the uh, uh, workshops that we've done, you may need to follow each one of these muscle slips all the way down to the rib, which we're not gonna cover today but uh, it's important to be able to slide up in the, the more advanced protocols and follow these tendon insertions distally. Um, and then finally, latissimus dorsi is the last thing that we look at in terms of this basic protocol. And so um, in that same position, I'm gonna go up and pick up a levator scat, I mean a latissimus dorsi, and I'm gonna slide down to the inferior meter border, realizing that um, uh, a high percentage of people, uh, the, actually the greatest percentage, have some type of attachment to the, um, the inferior meter border. So direct attachment and indirect are two different types, type one and type two. And what's important to know is if you have this attachment, you are less likely to have shoulder instability than if you have no attachment. But um, frequently you can see tears of this latissimus as it inserts into this area. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure you follow latissimus all the way down. The bulk of it goes around and continues inferiorly. It's a, you wanna practice following latissimus fibers all the way down to the lumbar spine, as well as uh, trapezial fibers uh, when you're first learning this uh, to the thoracic spine component. And then I kind of lastly, uh, I'll look at a functional component. This is a, uh, it turns into the more advanced component, but I'm looking for a glide of uh, Terry's minor uh, over the ribs. And uh, this fascial function is important because the fascia glides here over the rhomboid, uh, glides over the paraspinal muscle fascia. It's called the rhomboserrati fascial sling. We're not gonna get into that today, but uh, this um, uh, rhomboid has to slide over this tissue. And people that have that snapping sensation, what you'll see is the fascia balls up here and it'll snap underneath uh, uh, the scapula at that location. So for people with snapping scapula syndromes, I typically will do a functional component. So that's the kind of the basic exam. Uh, and if you're noticing that they have pain and tenderness in the midline, this is the spinous process. This is trap. Uh, this is rhomboid, and there's a tear of this trap uh, and its attachment to the spinous process. So it is important to uh, look at both the medial border and the spinous process if you're noticing weakness, uh, and this is actually rhomboid minor, uh, but um, so people that have weakness in the rhomboid, remember I said that she had poor activation of the rhomboid minor, and this tissue was stretched out in her slightly. And then finally, uh, again, uh, scan for tears of the trapezial origin or the rhomboid origin at the spinous process are all part of your scanning protocol, uh, especially if you're noticing on physical exam that weakness of the rhomboids. And so our patient uh, essentially had a normal uh, shoulder ultrasound evaluation that I had done previously. And then I brought her in for a scapular exam after she played tennis because for the most part, she couldn't reproduce her pain unless She's actively playing. Um, this is my report, uh, trapezius normal architecture, no atrophy, bilateral uh, superspace understandings for normal. She has a type one attachment of the latissimus torsi. Uh, the S uh, serratus anterior R1 uh, off the first rib had some irregular echo texture and it measured slightly larger uh, than the contralateral side, which may be uh, just right arm dominant. So I, I don't put a lot of weight into that. The levator scap was quite a bit thicker, uh, 6.3 versus 6.4 millimeters in thickness um, with a, what I call a double line noted. Um, and that double line is, is significant in this athlete. And we'll go over that. There was a small hyperchoic intercepted signal seen there. Uh, rhomboid uh, minor and major were symmetric at the spinous processes um, in terms of the attachments, no major tear. Uh, and then minor had a, smite, uh, a slight irregular echo texture at the scapular border. And the serrati fascia sling uh, appears slightly hypermobile uh, and lateralized. So we'll go over those findings. 
So here's our patient. Uh, uh, first of all, I'm doing my uh, rhomboid minor uh, portion of the scan and the windshield wiper component, and I'll see all these hypochoic uh, 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 findings here within that fascia layer. These are all swollen spinal accessory nerve fibers uh, in this uh, and then you can see the contralateral side that uh, doesn't have those. If you put power Doppler on these, none of them will, uh, in your lowest settings, they, they don't light up. You occasionally will see a vasculature in that area, but for the most part, uh, those hypochoic uh, signals or the spinal accessory nerve heading down to the, the uh, lower trap. When you do the look back technique at the uh, uh, superior meter border, uh, this is uh, what you see. So here's what I call a normal. And in this age group, you typically will see this secondary line. It's almost like an apophyseal uh, uh, signal where the, this isn't completely a t uh, uh, finished growing in terms of its maturation. And in adults, that should be a much clearer signal. Uh, here you see, this is the, actually the bony margin. You see this hyperechoic signal here, and then this sort of pulled off quite a bit further off this side versus here. The tendon actually looks okay, except for this small hyperechoic signal here. And so I just, I, I believe this is a small pull-off injury of the tendon as an attachment, a small tear here. We look at the serratus anterior, and again, another hyperechoic signal that's abnormal, oops. And um, the margin here is sort of rough and irregular. It should be a smooth margin. You should see that this is the second rib trap, the fascia layer over the top. This is all serratus anterior coming in. And so this is suggesting that um, she's injured this repetitive uh, uh, tennis. Uh, when we look at um, the rhomboid minor, which I remember I said it showed bogginess and poor activation, you sort of see a much clearer uh, image on this side. And this is kind of fuzzy here because that's the conjoined tenon component. But when I compare left versus right, um, this is very fuzzy and very uh, uh, difficult to see what's happening, loss of normal margins. It's just really cloudy almost. And to me, this is all sort of soft tissue swelling, suggesting some early tendinopathy or swelling of the tendon. And so obviously, um, I'm interested in this area and the fascia looks asymmetric in terms of its, its um, uh, thickness. And if it's hyperechoic, that may represent inflammation of that fascia layer as well. So putting all this together, we, uh, uh, we had her play tennis, we had her pop in um, and we did a tenogram uh, at this superior pin border. So this is straightest anterior. And I put, I leave air in the needle and I uh, put a lot of, I shake up the, um, leave like a, a CC of air in the syringe and I shake it up. Uh, so there's lots of tiny little bubbles and then I'll push the air out. And then uh, I'll advance the needle right to here. And when I inject that, if there's a tear in the, in the tin, in the, the, you'll see the air uh, signal will give a nice, uh, uh, it'll give you lots of information about the size and length and, si and, and the type of tear it is, whether it's complex or a simple tear. And so we did that with her, and this is the straightest anterior part, uh, no real air bubbles seek, uh, sneaking in there. What I then do is I put about 0.3% uh, lidocaine and point, uh, about a half a cc so that you can do muscle strength testing immediately. She had improvement in her strength. Uh, we sent her up to play tennis and she played tennis and the burning sensation came on. She came back with this horrible burning sensation and we uh, did a fascial hydrodissection of the spinal accessory nerve over the superior meter border, which resolved the burning sensation. After the season was over, we did a whole blood tenotomy to the entirety of the superior meter border doing the conjoined tenon component, again, addressing rhomboid minor, uh, levator scap and stratus anterior uh, for that. She uh, then went on to a scapular uh, uh, protocol that we've developed for, with a physical therapist I work with, and she's doing well, but hasn't restarted tennis this year. So that's kind of it. Uh, the key to scapular dyskinesis is a sophisticated history and physical exam, uh, and then uh, as well as functional, and use your ultrasound to confirm your hypothesis, and uh, then use uh, uh, localized injections with a, a low dose lidocaine so you don't affect muscular strength, but confirm whether or not you improve the strength and uh, resolve their symptoms. So with that, I'll take any questions. <clears throat> All right. Th thanks, Bill. That, that was really well done. I mean, this is such a complicated topic and to go through all that in 30 minutes, you know, I, 
It's a lot. I, I appreciate you doing that. You know, I've seen a couple different iterations of this talk at, at other various, you giving this talk at other various conferences. And, and every time I find myself, you know, picking up something and, and, and learning something else, I just, I just have one question. Um, you know, when you're, you know, a lot of the times when we're scanning these folks, you were comparing side to side and you mentioned a couple times measuring different thicknesses or sizes of muscle bulk, you know, within these periscapular muscles. And I'm just curious, what do you use as your reference ranges for different muscles that, that tell you what's clinically significant versus not Is it just kind of anecdotal experience, or do you have a specific reference that you use? Um, well, having done, you know, hundreds of these now, um, I really have to just rely uh, on left versus right because gosh, I mean, some people come in and the, the muscles are just massive and you're just like, holy criminy. But, you know, you look at what kind of work they do. So the classic example is the construction worker that pushes a wheelbarrow all around all day. Oh my God, their elevator <laughs> scaps are huge and the rhomboids are huge. And so it's kind of sports specific and what kind of weight training program or power lifting program they have. What's interesting and surprising though, is how often the, um, scapular retraction uh, isn't that uh, uh, well-developed in many of our athletes. And I believe that, and this is my personal opinion, but uh, the beginning of the end for the rotator cuff is, is poor scapular retraction stability of the scapula. I always uh, sort of explain it this way. You cannot push a car standing on a trampoline. And the same is true for the shoulder. If the rhomboid and the ability to hold and stabilize your scapula in retraction, you lose arm strength, power, uh, accuracy when throwing and strength. And so that, that is critical for your normal motion. And so, uh, these structures are really, really important, but I don't think there's a, you know, I guess I could start trying to keep track, but I don't really have a cutoff for these. Yeah. You know, this is Doug Hoffman. I would concur that anytime I'm scanning that area, I'm relying on the side to side changes. Just a quick comment here. So if, if you, Take the Phil's talk here, um, and then also if you go on to AIUM and look at his cervical and brachial plexus talk. I mean, obviously Phil has spent a lot of career energy um, sorting this out, doing the anatomy, and and really Phil has done the work with this. Um, I spent Phil and I go way back, and I spent a fair amount of time with him and seeing this evolution. And I'll tell you, you know, if you're on and you're saying, well, I'm trying to get my shoulder exam down, let alone you know, some of these uh, more advanced stuff. I will tell you in my practice, if you just go through and each time you pick up a little uh, tip, you know, whether it's, for example, the spinal accessory nerve, and and next time you get a little more familiar with the levator scapulae and, and so on and so forth, you will expand your shoulder exam and you will expand your ability to diagnose things that you haven't been able to diagnose. And so, you know, when, when you look at this talk, it's complex. And I know Phil, we asked Phil to pare it down um, because it, it can get really complex. Um, but if, if you just you know sit back and take a bird's eye view and say, okay, I'm going to just take one piece at a time. So I'm, I'm going to now, instead of just doing a regular shoulder exam, I'm going to expand it to, you know, one more thing, or this person's having pain. And, and so I've done that throughout the years and I've learned a lot from Phil. Um, and so when I do see a patient, I'm, I'm a lot, have more of an armamentarian to, to pick up things, certainly not at the level that Phil's doing it, but I've certainly picked up things I wouldn't be able to pick up um, just by slowly learning one step at a time beyond the regular shoulder exam. Um, so again, uh, he has a couple of these posted on AIUM on this together with, with this talk of scapular dyskinesis. You know, it, it's a lot to chew off, but if you just take it slowly, uh, you, you, your shoulder exam will, will take a new form. Yeah, I, 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 you know, that's how I really learned this stuff. I, when I started off doing a, a standard shoulder exam, I always picked another piece uh, of the puzzle. So uh, when I first started this, I did a lot of scanning up trap and levator scap a ton. Oh my God. Uh, uh, you know, there's so many, I've done so many million laps up there following levator scap up into the neck, into uh, the poster tubercles. Uh, that was, that's the piece. I, if I, if I had to encourage anybody to pick any piece of all of this to learn first, I would learn that trapezius upper trap 
uh, and levator scap component because there's there's two major landmines right there. You have a spinal accessory and dorsal scapula nerve underneath those fascial layers. And that's the easiest way to find them. And so you 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 can gain a lot of knowledge just by by doing that. And I think uh, you know that was the beginning of it for me was just sort of understanding that component. And then it just sort of sort of moved anterior, looking at the brachial plexus, moved posterior, looking at the medial border of the scapula. And you just kind of add uh, more to your exam, and you know all of a sudden you're you're as you get faster at your standard shoulder exam, you have more time to do these other things. So that. I, I agree completely with Doug that you just have to kind of broaden your horizon by challenging yourself to, to look at things you're just not comfortable with. All right. Any, anybody else have any other questions or comments that you'd want to make? If not, I don't see anybody unmuting themselves. All right. So we'll wrap it there. Thanks again, Phil. That was, you know, that, that was absolutely fantastic. And, um incredibly mm -hmm. educational so thank you uh thank you again for for doing mm -hmm. that um sure. for everybody else so uh, as usual off next week um, on 9 17 we're back uh, dr lauren rudolph is going to be giving us a talk on the thumb ucl injury with a stenter lesion um so again that'll be on on 9 17 mm -hmm. otherwise everybody have a great rest of your friday happy weekend um and uh we'll see you in a couple weeks thanks phil you're welcome